Hello everyone and welcome to SunUp. I'm Lyndall Stout. Instead of mostly orange this week, we're seeing a lot of green on the OSU campus. It is roundup time and that means hundreds of 4-H members from across Oklahoma are here in Stillwater. We'll have much more from here at Roundup a little bit later in the show. But first, Austin Moore takes us to Jackson County to see how the cotton crop is faring. No way around it. This year is better than last. Last year, we didn't have any uh, rains to get the, get the crop up and we had to water our cotton up. First time I started, I started farming in 1978 and it's the first time that I ever had to water cotton up. We always get some spring rains to get our crops up. When you consider how much of Oklahoma's cotton crop is grown right here, the importance of that becomes clear. We're kind of where we're located right now. It's basically the center of the Luger Altus Irrigation District. It's about a 20 mile long irrigation district. We water about 50,000 acres. 50 to 60 percent of the cotton that's grown in Oklahoma will be in the Luger Altus Irrigation District. So after last year's disappointment, this year started with farmers feeling like the worst was behind them. I mean, this is as, about as good a start to a crop as we've had in a number of years. We got an excellent stand of cotton and uh, everything looked really good. We got some timely rains early on and uh, since then it's turned off hot and dry and uh, we don't have any water in the lake. We hadn't had water in the last couple years in our reservoir to, to water with. So hot and dry with the reservoir at 21% of capacity. Clearly not a good combination. But to better explain exactly what that means to the physiology of the crop, we turn to OSU Extension Cotton Specialist, Randy Bowman. Talk about evapotranspiration and, and what that term really means in terms of these plants and, and their use of water. Okay, really what evapotranspiration is, it's combined uh, evaporation pretty much from uh, the, the soil and if there happens to be water on the leaf surfaces too, uh, that evaporation and then transpiration which is the water, the moisture that's taken up by the crop and is pulled up through the stomates. So uh, really when we look at uh, evapotranspiration or as we use the acronym ET, uh, uh, the, the, the crop starts out with a very low uh, ET uh, requirement earlier in the season and as we uh, begin to get closer to the fruiting cycle, uh, squaring our demands go up a little bit more and then certainly once we get into bloom then uh, we're reaching our peak ET uh, amounts. And, and right now there's a couple of factors affecting that. First of all, the, these temperatures. I mean that 100 plus temperatures just shoot that rate right up. That's exactly right. Uh, you know if we had more, even when we go into the bloom stage we can see a lot of variability in terms of what the crop ET may be. Uh, it may be as low as 0.25 if the temperatures are maybe in the upper 80s, lower 90s uh, when, it's, when, it's, when the crop is blooming, or it may be as high as uh, 0.55 like what we experienced on some days in, uh, in that uh, terrible, terrible 2011 drought that, that we went through last year. So that's just quite a bit of water demand. And this is the time of year, this is the stage of development for the plants where they're really just sucking up the water as much as they can. That is is exactly right and you know really what we, we uh, when we we reach that peak water demand, we really have to uh, be able to, to meet that if we're going to make a crop. And unfortunately, with the situation we have uh, with no rainfall uh, within the last uh, couple of weeks that was you know, substantial in most of the area, uh, uh, couple that with reaching our uh, peak bloom, and then of course we have a forecast that's pretty brutal that shows we're going to be uh, well above triple digits for I guess perhaps for the next 10 days. So Randy, let's talk about crop potential and where we sit with this one. And I guess the, the term that always comes up is nodes above white flower. Really show us what that means in the plant. Okay, Austin, we can uh, hopefully reach down here and uh, remove a plant if it's gonna cooperate. There we go. Uh, and I broke it in half, unfortunately. But uh, certainly what we look at uh, is, a, is a physiological measure uh, that's called nodes above white flower. And really what we, we wanna look for uh, is uh, a first position white bloom, and, and this is one because it's closest to the main stem on this fruiting branch. And we want to trace back to the main stem and then begin to count up toward the terminal. So this would be uh, zero, this becomes one, this is two, uh, this would be three, and this would be four. So this plant right here at uh, early bloom, and we can go back and look and see that we've actually had uh, uh, some blooming uh, go down prior. Uh, there's a, a, a bowl there that's probably uh, six or seven days old perhaps, and then here's one uh, that bloomed about three days ago right here, 
and of course the petals, the bloom tag is, uh, has fallen off the plant. And then as we come up here, uh, we have an open flower. So uh, four nodes above white flower, and, and really what this plant would have been at at first bloom would have probably been somewhere around five, perhaps six. And uh, what that indicates is really a very low yield potential. Hmm. Uh, normally what we like to see uh, with nodes above white flower at first, at first bloom uh, would be perhaps uh, eight to 10 to maybe 11. Because what that means is, is that really about 80% of your yield potential that's on the cotton plant at first bloom is what you're gonna take to the gin. So the more uh, nodes above white flower you have, the more yield potential. Now it doesn't mean that we're gonna actually have more yield because we have to have uh, the environment uh, in order to, uh, to to keep that plant sustained, uh, we have to have irrigation. As, as we mentioned earlier when we were talking about uh, a crop ET, of course, uh, uh, we have to meet uh, uh, probably somewhere in the neighborhood of 0.35 to perhaps uh, 0.4 inches per day depending upon the environment. And, and right. again, as we said, it could be as high as much as 0.55 last year right. uh, on some of the days once we hit the bloom stage. But uh, it is a, uh, uh, a good indicator, and I really like to use this because uh, if we can if we can track nodes above white flower, it gives us some indications of what the overall crop yield potential is. And then uh, once we reach what we call the cutout stage, we can we can use uh, nodes above white flower plus so many heat units uh, past a certain uh, nodes above white flower value to help us determine when we might need to uh, perhaps uh, uh, terminate irrigation or terminate some potential insecticide applications, or perhaps even uh, terminate the crop with harvest aid products. All right. Okay, so that doesn't look good on this plant, but across the area, what are you seeing in terms of that measure? Well, uh, we're surveying uh, a lot of our extension trials, or at least uh, Jerry Goodson is our IPM uh, extension assistant here at the Altus Center. Uh, he's making uh, about a 750 mile swing uh, every week looking at a uh, various trials scattered out in about nine counties uh, in pretty much in southwest Oklahoma here. And what we found, what we can discover by looking at that data is that we had a, a pretty high amount of yield potential early on in a lot of these fields, uh, especially the irrigated fields. And the issue becomes, can we deliver the water for that con crop's consumptive use that it's getting ready to have or is actually underway now? Uh, can we deliver the amount of water to keep that uh, crop sustained? And of course, uh, right here in the irrigation district, we don't have any allocation of water this year right. because of the lake situation, but other areas where they do have groundwater, uh, the crops are progressing extremely well. So we're very happy with that. Uh, the bad news is I think that a lot of the dry land, even though we were able to get really nice stands and, and have a great start on, on a lot of the dry land, uh, because of the situation we've had with the heat and the lack of rainfall, I'm not sure that we're, we're going to be very optimistic on that side. All right, so it was a really good start, but right now the main thing is you really need rain. We absolutely need rain, and uh, for some of the dry land, uh, we could probably get some rain soon and it would help it, but unfortunately I believe we're in a spiral where we're going to be in, in serious trouble here within a couple of weeks, especially if the triple digit uh, temperatures continue to, uh, to be forecast. The producers are, you know, ourselves we have insurance, the, in 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 we'll you know we'll be able to collect our insurance, and we can. It's not a it's not a great deal, and that's what federal crop insurance is for. Is is it's a backup to help you survive. It the bigger issue is the cotton gins, the oil mill in Oklahoma City, the cotton compress, the 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 guys that work for us. I mean we we don't have near as many people working for us, so it hurts. At Woods, it hurts the supermarkets. It hurts, you know, the clothing stores. It hurts. It really hurts the communities, you know, all over Southwest Oklahoma. And that has this community, not just the farmers, praying for rain. Mm -hmm.